And so if a PDRM is a meaningful concept, we need to have evidence that it is, that, that is the case. So, uh, so Lisa and I published a paper together in 2013 where, where we talked about some of this and her point at the time was, prove to me that a PDRM exists. And what I want to show you now is a couple of pieces of evidence, but, but the point is there's not a huge data set out there yet. Despite the length of time that sedimentary paleomagnetism has been going, there is not a huge evidence base to support the existence of a PDRM. And we're in the phase of, of recollecting that. So this is a paper uh, published by Leonardo Signotti and colleagues in, in Italy. And what they took, did was they took a pair of sediment cores from the Gulf of Salerno. And, and they measured the, the, the secular variation in that record. And what they found, uh, typically if you're taking two cores and you want to compare the paleomagnetic record, you me measure some physical parameter like magnetic susceptibility, and you put those records on top of each other. And when you do that, what you get with the, the characteristic Roman inclination is a signal that looks very similar, but that's somewhat offset. And the blue core uh, leads the yellow down here and it lags the yellow up here. And you can clearly correlate the two. They look very good if you just correlate the, the, the inclinations. Um, but then that would defy the physical correlation of the magnetic susceptibility. So what Sanotti et al. interpreted this to be is an indication of lock in depth variations. And this is not an absolute measure of lock in, it's a relative measure between the two cores. And what they find is that deeper in the record where the blue lags, uh, the blue leads the yellow, uh, you get a positive difference of up to about 15 centimeters. And in the upper part, you get a negative difference where, the, where, where it lags the yellow. And so they would argue that that's evidence of, of, of lock-in depth uh, of a PDRM. And um, to me, this makes intuitive sense. What it says, is lock-in is not a uniform thing. It varies through time. And the delivery of nutrients to the seafloor varies through time. The bioturbation depth ought to vary through time because of availability of nutrients. So, so I'm quite comfortable with the idea of it not being a constant function, of it being time variable. That, to me, makes sense. Another example of a, of a PDRM lock-in is from the work of Yusuke Suganuma. Dave Heslock and I were co-authors on this. And it was, a, again, a Bruns Matiyama boundary record with a relative paleo intensity, took one, did two, uh, Australasian microtectite event, et cetera, and the beryllium 10 record with dip one and dip two. Jean-Pierre Vallée is going to talk about beryllium 10 records later this afternoon, so I don't need to. Um, but what you can see is that these two records are offset from each other. The argument would be that this is, is because of the lock in depth. Um, and when you, when you put a, a filter into it, uh, you, you get a, a lock-in depth of 16 centimeters out of it. Interestingly, the, the best fit filter is a, is a Gaussian one. In this case, some of us were discussing this yesterday. Um, and that's a microtech by the way. So that's just a couple of examples that I would give you, but, but, the, but Lisa's point is right. There's not a vast amount of evidence out there in support of the PDRM. And, and I think quite a few of us are in the process of doing more work to try and amass more of an evidence base, which I think is, is really important. Um, so let's talk now about efficiency or, or lack thereof of sedimentary magnetizations. So this is a paper that uh, Dave and I did uh, with a computer scientist who, who uh, help put all, all of the, the code through a, a supercomputer to do these calculations. Um, and, and what we said was, well, what is a sedimentary, what is a sedimentary magnet, magnetization? It's effectively uh, a, a record that's slightly biased away from random. So if we treated it, the original magnetization is just random, and a reviewer called this a, a physics-free model, which it is, right? And we treat the physics as a black box and say any particle reorientation process is in that black box. We don't care what it is. It's a statistical model. And, and what you need to do is to go from random to a, an efficiently, to, a, to a, a reliably recorded magnetization. 
how much reorientation do you need to go through to get a reliable record? So just a, a, a conceptual thing. So we start with random and we track movements of particles as we rotate them toward the ambient field direction. The, the distribution of both is Fisherian. We do 2,500 Monte Carlo simulations of up to a million particles. We treat each particle as a unit vector. And essentially what we're doing is saying, if this is the mean direction and that's the alpha 95 around it, how much rotation does each particle need to go through to get within that 95% uncertainty? Um, and so delta theta is the angular change that that magnetic moment needs to rotate through. Okay? And, and so then uh, delta theta 50 is the median rotation angle required to get from, from whatever random state to, to a, a non-random state. And this is uh, the result of the simulations. And um, so this is for if you want to be within 10 degrees of, of the mean or, or if you want to be within five degrees of the mean and from one particle up to a, a million. And clearly for one particle, errors are large uh, and large rotations are required. L over N, L is the, the sum of the unit vectors and N is the total number of particles. So if you've only got one particle, you have to align it it's going to be perfectly efficient, but with a big rotation. The more particles you get, uh, the less rotation you need, and, and the less efficient it's going to be, the more partial cancellation you will have. Okay, So it's, it's pretty simple. Um, and for to get within 10 degrees of the mean, the 10,000 particles, you only need to do a, a, a median rotation of 6 degrees. If you've got a million particles and think how many particles you have in a, in a sediment, it's a lot. It's a lot, right, to be able to measure it. So for a million particles, it's less than a degree away from rotation, away from randomness to produce a faithfully recorded direction. So as I say, this is physics free. It's, it's purely a statistical model, but I think it gives us a, a, a reasonable sense of how much difference from randomness we're, we're actually measuring. And, and actually, it's a robust signal. Okay, so then the question is, why is it so inefficient? And um, we've talked about flocculation. Oceanographers call it marine snow. You look at photographs of, of the deep ocean, and it's, it's like this. It's messy. It's, it's flocculated particles. And so Lisa has done some very nice modeling of, of these. I think uh, I'd have to reread to remember, but... Um, my, my recollection is that, uh, so this is DRM over SIRM for a single uh, 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 moment in a flock. And for small flocks, the magnetization saturates very quickly. For larger flocks, you get a more linear-like relationship, which is what we're used to seeing in sediments. And then if you do compound flocks with, with multiple moments, you, 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 you get slightly different things. Um, and, and she did some new models as I, uh, in, in this paper that we did together. And the point, this was before Dave Heslop's uh, 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 hydrodynamic flock model. And so what Lisa did here was she separated uh, flocks that can be magnetically aligned from those that are hydrodynamically aligned. And this, these are the distributions of each component. And, and even if you have a tiny portion of magnetically aligned, uh, uh, flocks, you can see that most of the flocks are random, recording random directions, but you can get a bias towards a really reliable field direction with, with flocks. Um, and so I think this goes a long way to describing the inefficiency of sedimentary magnetizations. Is that all that's going on? I don't think so. And I think we're learning, we're learning more as, as we go, but this is producing a low efficiency magnetization, but a high fidelity recording. Uh, and, and this is the field vector in, in this model. And, it, and it's, there's inclination errors in some of these, but, but in this one, it's recording pretty well. Okay, um, something that we've been working on more recently is, is we, we do a lot of electron microscopy in our group. Um, I, I, I'm quite critical of how our community functions in terms of putting things in magnetometers and measuring them. I call it magnetic remote sensing. And there's a lot of stuff we don't know when we do that. And um, we heard a lot about, uh, about silicates with inclusions yesterday um, and how they record paleomagnetic signals in igneous rocks. Well, sediments are the erosional products of 
all types of rocks, including those rocks. And um, whenever we do a magnetic extract, we have silicates in them. And early in my career, I thought, oh, my, ex my extractions are not very good. I've got all this quartz in it. Why is that? Um, and, and more recently, we've been going back even to some of those extracts from 30 years ago. Um, and anyway, we're getting silicates in all our extracts and we're looking at them under the TEM and we're seeing nanoparticulate magnetic inclusions in, in all of them. Um, and I don't know if you can see that. It's hard for me to see from, from here, but there's equidimensional uh, uh, magnetites, titan magnetites in some of these. There's dendritic textures that are very common in these rocks. There's crystallographically aligned. Uh, things. I talked about this at AGU, and, and this is a paper that's just come out in December in JGR, where we show a whole range of textures and, and, and features of, of these types of materials. So, um, and particularly in, in diagenetically reduced environments where, where the unprotected detrital magnetite has been dissolved, these things become more important than, than they might otherwise be. So, are they giving rise to a paleomagnetic signal? I would have thought not, and it would be very un uncomfortable to conclude yes. So we thought, well, let's try and model it. Um, I like simple models because they, they give you a, a constraint that, that you can play with. So what we did was we said, okay, um, let's deal with particles with different aspect ratios. If you're spherical at an aspect ratio of one, life is simpler, but once you start becoming more ellipsoidal, uh, hydrodynamic forces become very important during settling. And so this, this contour line in each case represents the point at which hydrodynamic forces dominate on the right and magnetic forces can potentially dominate on the left. And the different colored lines are for different concentrations of magnetite in, in the silicate host particle. Um, and so you would think 10% magnetite is probably too large, 1% probably reasonable. But anyway, the, the point is that for a range of, of particle magnetite concentrations, when you're in the fine silt sediment size range, which is often what we're dealing with in sediments, um, that's a size range where you don't need too much magnetite for these things to be capable, potentially, of recording a paleomagnetic signal. Does it mean they are? No, it's just a model. Um, but, but we're trying to understand and put constraints around, is it reasonable to conceive of these things giving rise to a sedimentary magnetic signal? Um, as I say, it's an uncomfortable conclusion, but uh, if I have time, I sh I'll show you some data. Okay, so that's a quick, a quick tour through a PDRM. It's a variable beast. Um, Lock-in can vary quite a lot in the same place, I would argue. Um, but I would say it's a much better mechanism to explain sedimentary magnetism than a, than a true VRM. I'd say we still have a lot to learn. And we're at a phase in, our, in our, the, the history of our field, I think, where we're rebuilding knowledge up from the basics. We're, we're recollecting the data to, to test some of these core concepts <coughs> in our discipline. Okay, what about magnetotactic bacteria? Um, uh, our, our friends who, who like back these things say that they're ubiquitous. Um, and if they are, how do they affect sediment magnetization? In terms of a PDRM, I've shown a few bacteria, magnetotactic bacteria here, and, and the, the, the view is that if they live in the water column or in the surface mixed layer, when they die, their particles are effectively like, like detrital particles. They're aligned passively by the field, uh, so we don't need to worry about them too much. But if they live within the historic sediment layer, then they can give rise to another type of magnetization that's been called a biogeochemical remnant magnetization, which is a term coined by John Tarduno and, and one of the students 20 years ago. And it gets some airplay, but um, it's never really been demonstrated one way or the other how common this is. And if bacteria, if magnetotactic bacteria are important in sediments, um, then, then we've got an extra complication to deal with, uh, and it needs to be evaluated. Throughout my career, I thought magnetotactic bacteria, well, they're an interesting curiosity, but they really don't matter. They don't survive in the geological record. Why? Diagenesis will kill them off. Why? Um, well, 
uh, where do they live? They live pretty much at the boundary between nitrate reduction and, and iron reduction. So in what used to be called suboxic uh, environments. Um, there's a lot of difficulty with these traditional terms. So I now use the term ferruginous to refer to iron reducing environments. Anyway, they, they, they happen here, right? And um, the microbiologist would say that magnetotactic bacteria are great in organisms. They live around the oxic and oxic interface uh, in, in water columns or at the uppermost sediment. And the point of that is that once you bury them, uh, this whole progression moves upwards and you get into sulfate reducing environments and that destroys magnetite. So if they're gradient organisms, they're not geologically meaningful because they will be dissolved. Uh, and I've always thought that. Um, and, and less than 10 years ago, Bob Kopp and Joe Gershwin published this uh, review paper on, on the fossil record of magnetotactic bacteria. And they concluded that the pre-quaternary magnetofossil record is sparse. More magnetofossil bearing localities have been identified in the quaternary than in all of the rest of Earth history. So I'm right, aren't I? I thought I was. And then we got some methods that help us to identify uh, fossil magnetosome better. TEM is the gold standard, but fork diagrams are really helpful and ferromagnetic resonance are really helpful. Um, and, and we do a lot of forks, we do some FMR, we do a lot of TEM, and we're finding these things to be ubiquitous in marine carbonates, for example, almost dominate the magnetic signal. Um, back in a long tens of millions of years and longer in, in time. So they're much more commonly documented now than they were in the past. And it's, it's revolutionized my view of sedimentary magnetizations. But the question is, is it just a PDRM or is it a BRM or is it some combination of both? That's, that's really the question. So what we've been trying to do in recent years is to look at, at marine sediments and to see what different constituents magnetically exist in the sediments and do they have different recording capacity. So this is a paper we did by, by a young lady who visited us from, from Guangzhou and she was studying a series of sediment cores from the South China Sea. And uh, what we found was that the DMAG uh, curves, if you look at NRM remaining against ARM remaining for these curves, they have, they're quite curved. Um, and this is a, a parameter that, that describes curvature uh, against median destructive field. And what you find is that the least curved curves are the red ones here, um, have lower MDF, and the, the more curved ones, the blue, have higher MDF. And, and these are more detrital dominated and these are more biogenic dominated. And, and so we have various mixtures between biogenic and detrital in these sediments. Um, and so what we tried to do was to, to objectively estimate which demagnetization, which part of the demagnetization spectra was, was uh, controlled by, by the, the detrital and which by the, 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 the biogenic and, and leave out the, the part where both were contributing. And then look at the, the, the paleomagnetic signal recorded. So uh, from 5 to 25 millitesla was the detrital component, from 50 to 80 was the biogenic component. If you do a, a, a principal component analysis fit to, 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 to get a characteristic remnants for both and compare them, uh, there's minor differences. But if you do a cross-correlation effectively, there is no phase lag between those signals. So what we would argue that tells us is that there is a biogenic component, there is a detrital component, they're both recording exactly the same signal, and it's not a BRM. It's, it's just a... These things are dying, they're getting mixed in the sediment, and they're contributing to a remnant magnetization, just like all the detrital particles. What about recording efficiency? If they had the same efficiency, they would fall on the one-to-one -one line on these curves. Uh, and what we're seeing is that they're biased towards the biogenic component. And so the ratio of the biogenic to the detrital for ARM is two to four times more efficient for the biogenic and the detrital. Uh, same with the IRM, two to four times. Is that a grain size effect? Because ARM is preferentially affected by single domain particles, which, which biogenic particles are. Um, and the argument is yes, there is some effect to, to that extent. Um, but it doesn't explain all of it. So 
there is a there is a definite greater efficiency of remnants acquisition in the biogenic compared to the detrital. So that's interesting. Um, This is this one's a little more controversial. Um, so let me let me make a conclusion from that before I, before I go there. Um, so the point of that is that if you have a sediment core where you have a detrital component and a biogenic component in the same core, if they vary in phase with each other, they're recording the same signal. So it's all constructive. If they vary out of phase with each other, you've got a record where the two efficiencies are working against each other, and you've got a much more complicated record. And it's not hard to do this kind of analysis. So I would say for routine relative paleo intensity analysis, it becomes more important to consider potential variations in the efficiency of magnetization of different magnetite components. Okay, so let me move on to another case. This is from the equatorial, uh, Eastern Equatorial Pacific Ocean. And it's another case where, where we have biogenic magnetite. You can see these beautiful particles. Some are aligned and chained still, despite the vigor of our extraction procedure. Uh, and you can see various morphologies of these, these particles. Um, what surprised us is that the magnetic properties of the sediment were almost, bulk sediment, almost single domain-like. You almost never see that. And when you do, it's typically dominated by biogenic magnetite. Um, Yet there was this low coercivity component. There's definitely two components in these sediments. And, and the uncomfortable conclusion was that uh, we couldn't see any other traditional, what you'd consider detrital magnetite. Um, and these scanning TEM images show uh, uh, fairly equidimensional particles, more elongated uh, inclusions within silicate hosts. And these are more dendritic type textures within a silicate host. And this is a map of one of these types of particles where you see uh, there's iron, there's a silicate host, there's iron, and there's a small amount of titanium. So these are low titanium type of magnetites uh, controlling the remnant magnetization of these silicate particles. Um, and you can see spot readings from, from, from this guy over here. And what we see is that I haven't showed it, but th this record records the, the paleo intensity stacks beautifully. You see the standard record for both components. If you look at the low coercivity component by itself, it maps uh, the, 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 the global stacks, and the high coercivity component maps the global stacks. And so if we separate, do the same analysis that I showed you before, what we see, again, the one to one line would indicate equal efficiency for the biogenic and detrital magnetite. Uh, for ARM, again, we see a two to four times greater efficiency of magnetization for the biogenic component. For the IRM, it's a whole lot less. And there could be grain size effects controlling that difference uh, within the single domain size range uh, that affect ARM more than IRM. Um, but if you look at ARM over IRM as a, as a proxy for grain size variation, effectively, the two single domain components have pretty much, sometimes it's weaker, sometimes it's stronger, but on average, it's on the one-to-one -one line. So, um, so our conclusion from this is actually these, these inclusion-rich particles can record a paleomagnetic signal. I find that an uncomfortable conclusion, but that's where, where we're led. Um, and it has recorded an RPI signal that's way less efficient than the biogenic magnetite. So, um, just a, a note about the alignment efficiency of magnetosomes. Um, what what uh, Ramon's group, Ramon Egli's group would say is, is that uh, if, if the bacteria are living in sediment rich environments, the, the magnetotactic bacteria will resort to chemotaxis rather than magnetotaxis and then inefficient magnetization arises. They get flocculated just like any other magnetic particles, the argument goes. And so you can expect very inefficient magnetizations uh, for magnetofossils as well, of the order of a couple of percent. So I want to wrap up. Um, so I would argue that despite 65 plus years of sedimentary paleomagnetism, there's still a lot of questions. Um, uh, I think we're making progress. I still think there's a lot more to do. We've we need to demonstrate how sediments are magnetized. Um, as I said, the PDRM concept has, has, has taken on some damage. And if it's real, we need to test it properly 
and do a whole lot of whole work. But that's a that's a, a quick snapshot of my sense of play on the subject, and I'd be delighted to take questions. Prevalence and how you detect them. So the gold standard, we all agree, is 